Hello and welcome to Not That This, the pop culture talk show where I interview artists and influencers to find out their fool's gold and hidden gems. Those massively popular things that they hate and those unknown or underrated masterpieces that they love. My name's Geraint Evans, that is my privilege, it is also my curse. So this is episode 9, I want you to have a creative voice in this podcast, so I'm allowing you to choose my theme tune. You're currently hearing one of the options, I'll tell you how to vote at the end of the episode. Today's guest is Jeffrey Craner, he's one of the creators and writers on two of my favourite fiction podcasts, Within the Wires and Welcome to Night Vale. He was one of those emails I sent out on a whim, I saw that Night Vale was touring in the UK and I never expected to hear back really, but I did. And after meeting Jeffrey I get why, he's super nice and supportive and charming. I really enjoyed spending some time with him and you know he'd listen to the podcast and you can tell he'd really put some thought into his choices for Fool's Gold and Hidden Gem. Anyway, here's the interview. Hello Jeffrey. <laughs> Hello Gary. Uh, <laughs> so if you're sensing amusement it's because we've just talked for about 10 minutes uh-huh. and uh, re- then realised the podcast mic had died. It was amazing. It, it was, was a, pure gold, really. It was a brilliant that like, yeah. you will not hear anything better than yeah. what we. <laughs> Th- that's just for us. Sure. <laughs> right. Okay. So, Jeffrey, you're here in London, meeting up with your Within the Wires co-creators, yeah, and, and promoting the tour for Night Vale. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, Night Vale's just finishing up a, a big old European tour. Uh, mm. They started a few weeks ago in Helsinki, and are finishing up in. Cardiff and Bristol this week, and um, wow. we just did a London show at the Apollo Victoria in the West End. Uh, so we got Such to perform. It's uh, really amazing. Yeah. We got to perform on the Wicked stage. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was it was great. So I came over so I could do the the show in Dublin where I have friends, and and the show in London where I have friends, and then yeah. uh, in between I've been meeting with uh, Janina and Mary, my two co creators and collaborators for the Within the Wires podcast. Yeah, yeah the other yeah. show I do. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, like I said before, uh-huh. <laughs> I've listened to Within the Wise. I think I'm one episode ahead, am I? I got, a, I got a cheeky press copy. Yeah, you did. You, you got the first three episodes, and the third episode actually goes up uh, tomorrow morning. So, oh, right. uh, so, public, so, so it'll be out for you then. Yeah. Um, but it means I have to wait an extra day. That's before. right. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting way to tell a story. It's very similar to the first series. Like in that it's it's just cassettes, you know, telling a story, but it's a different type of cassette. It's a different kind of story. Is that your plan for it going forward? Like as an anthology series? Yeah, that was our hope. Is each 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 season, each year that we do these ten episodes, is to have a um, a different set of cassettes that sort of like found audio, maybe you know, in the yeah. first season being relaxation cassettes and as you sort of listen to these cassettes teaching you how to breathe and do different like exercises and visualizations and things like that you sort of realize oh I'm a prisoner in some type of medical institution <laughs> and um, in, in some alternate universe and uh, in this new season we sort of imagine the, the listener like listening to uh, museum audio guides from all over the world told yeah. by the same scholar and, and learning about her relationship to this one particular artist and uh, yeah, it was this idea of like it's sort of fun to unfurl a story yeah. through something that isn't inherently your normal way of telling a story. No. And so we try and find those those ways of, of kind of building out the world and the universe and within the wires. And each season, yeah. sort of different characters, but maybe probably something tying over from one season yeah, to the yeah. next. I mean, that's the interesting thing about about podcasts, right? Is that you can tell the kind of story that you couldn't just go out and tell on, on radio. Yeah. Right, so you've got these shows within the wires and Night Vale as well, where you know it's not necessarily like a, a defined narrative, but mm-hmm. you've got all these clues and you can put together the story yourself. Mm-hmm. So sort of as a participating character, really, uh, like in Night Vale, presumably you live in Night Vale and you're listening to the to the radio broadcast, yeah. right? And in these cassette tapes, you're listening to the the museum guide. You're taking in the relaxation tape. You're right, right. <laughs> And you can't do that on radio, really. No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I, I think you, I guess you could to some extent, but I, I feel like with podcasting, because you can, because they're portable and, and storable, and you yeah. can listen to them at any time. It's it's not a thing where I need to be at a certain place at a certain time uh, <laughs> yeah, to get yeah. through that. And also, 
you know, I always use the reference of like, I think earbuds just changed everything because those voices are literally in your ears. Yeah, and absolutely. it's such a, such a personal and intimate connection you have with your host. Um, whether it's yeah. direct fictional narrative of a single voice narrator like Cecil or uh, this season of Within the Wires, uh, Rima Tewiata is our lead actor and, yeah. and she... Uh, is really really tremendous but all the way to like a, a more improvisational uh you know uh, chat shows or comedy shows yeah, or yeah, things yeah. like that it's it's um i use so many different <laughs> chat shows to um like when i getting ready to board a plane or something it's just like i, I don't really have time to get on my computer and do any work and it's just something where yeah, i can yeah. like play a puzzle on my phone and listen to like two people i don't know <laughs> chat like i do know them right like yeah, i'm just yeah, sitting yeah, next yeah. to them and it, it's uh yeah it's very it's very easy and comforting and that's something radio I don't feel like can quite do. Yeah, no, it feels like there's a... So the, one of these podcasts with, with Ben Norris, episode six, he, he picks commercial radio DJs. It's mm-hmm. the thing he hates. It's full <laughs> gold, right? And I, I get that from radio. There's like a pressure to it. If you know what I mean, like I these know. people like really want you there listening, you know. Yeah. And of course, if you're making a podcast, you want people to listen to it. But it's not... You can do it in your own way. Yeah. You don't have to be the slick. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to keep people listening through the tees. I mean, you do want them to stick around. Like within the wires, we put ads in the mid roll and things like yeah, that. Yeah. And so you want to do certain things. Like I always try and write funny or bizarre, or right. quirky ads to to make it more to make people want to keep listening. To be like, oh, well, I like his ads. They're funny and they do a yeah. thing. But yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to play to the lowest common denominator either, you know, to keep yeah, yeah, yeah. the highest possible ratings. And yeah, that's interesting. Like about the ads, because I'd noticed that I'd noticed your ads were, were funny mm-hmm. and very deliberately so. You could tell that you thought about it. I think because I was wondering with with advertising in a in a podcast like yours, which is a narrative, you mm-hmm. know, it's um, it's a very personal story. Do you worry about that kind of mid-roll advertising, the stopping, stopping the story for a bit to tell you to listen to Audible or I, whatever? I definitely do because I hate advertising, you know, in a lot of ways. <laughs> I mean, who likes advertising? No, I, um, but I, it, it's it's the way artists get paid. It's the way you support yourself. It's the way you have a job. And yeah. um, I, I heard you talking. Uh, I think it was in your first episode about yeah, yeah. about not wanting to do ads because it, it does take. And I, I completely agree with that. Like it, yeah. it's there's. In order for podcasting to be free, one way of doing that is through advertising. Yeah. And, it, and it provides a way for people can hear it for free without feeling like I have to pay for something. Yeah. However, an ad, listening to an ad or watching an ad on television or just seeing a billboard, yeah, yeah. there's a form of payment for existing in the world. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it does, it takes a toll. It, 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 yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, I, I say I don't want to do advertising on this podcast. If someone came to me with a product which... I liked and I thought, like, unarguably mm-hmm. helped artists. I'd be like, okay, maybe then, yeah. Yeah. But, like, you know, it, it annoys me when someone tries to sell me underwear. In a <laughs> I'm like, I buy my own, I know where to get my underwear. Uh-huh. Like, or yeah. mattresses. And I'm like, you buy a mattress like once every 50 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe we should do that more often, but. <laughs> that's, that's very true. I, you know, the good thing about having done these ads for Within the Wires is, is that I, I, it was really nice that I was able to, like, get the product from everybody I've used right, so okay. far. So like I did a, a I did a Warby Parker ad. So I was like, I'm gonna check out these glasses. These are great. <laughs> um, and then uh, you do, you know, you do. I did Casper mattress ads, yeah. and they sent me one, and I was like, I got a free mattress out of this, and it's like hella good. It's so great, and yeah. um, so I'm, I feel very happy about doing it. I've been an Audible subscriber since 2005. So yeah. advertising for Audible is. Com- completely reasonable for me to talk about and yeah, that's things fair. so those are those are fun um i've never used any of the underwear subscription services um <laughs> but but listen I'm a, I'm a big fan of the mcelroy brothers and uh the adventure zone and my brother and my brother and me these are two okay. of my favorite podcasts and i went out and bought a movement watch because griffin mcelroy told me to over and over and over again it's <laughs> like fine i will right, i'll support okay, your then. show like that yeah uh, I mean, yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, that's just, I only want, I, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd have mentioned it had, had you not just said. Yeah. Uh, but it, it is something I think about. And, you know, it is hard, I think, as an artist to exist in the world. Like, so something we, we, we talked about in, in the bit that wasn't recorded, apparently, <laughs> uh, was how podcasting is great because it's, there is a very low bar to access. Like, if you want to create, it doesn't cost 
a hell of a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Like there's a little bit of hosting cost. You got to buy a mic, maybe. Yeah. But, but you can get into it. But it does cost time. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for a lot of people, I think you don't. There's so many people that I think have interesting stories to tell. There's a lot of people who didn't have any type of like radio degree from college or haven't been an yeah, intern yeah. at a station or. Um, even worked as a musician having to record their own stuff or, yeah. or even just know how to plug in an app and um, yeah. or edit a track. And so there is a lot of stuff you have to kind of self-teach. Um, right. And as you get better at it, it moves faster. You also learn how to listen to your own stuff and say, why does it sound like this when I do that? And you're like, oh, this USB cord is jacked and that's why it's fuzzy when it comes out or whatever. So I think like, that's your real cost is learning. But it, it's such a low barrier to entry that like I... I've never made a TV show or even just a YouTube video of any value um, or a film. And I can't imagine the amount of money it takes to just screw up over and over in order to get it right. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I think... So I read an interesting thing about movies, like why bad movies get made. Mm -hmm. And it's because basically nobody knows what's going on. Because they're all done, they're shot out of order, they don't know what the the post work is going to look like. Uh Uh, so while they're making it everyone thinks they're making a good movie everyone always thinks they're making a good movie yeah. I think maybe not always but and then you put it all together and you're like oh god what a <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> well and yeah I guess you always have to have room for people to like grow and learn from something too you know that, yeah. that's what's always interesting is it's very for, for artists who have a, a, a huge catalog to go back through it's really interesting to be like oh, I've gone back through like Kubrick's early work is just so different than blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, of course it is. Like, he aged and he did a lot yeah. more things and you just, you learn uh, yeah. how to do different things. And uh, yeah, and you also, or oh, movies, that, that's the other thing is like movies or books or TV shows that don't hold up. And you yeah. watch them in 2017 eyes, with your 2017 eyes and you think, how did, how did they think this was okay? <laughs> Um, yeah. Why is Charlton Heston in brown face throughout all, all of Touch of Evil <laughs> pretending to be Mexican? <laughs> and he doesn't even like try to have like a Mexican <laughs> accent of any sort. I mean, that's probably for the best, <laughs> right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, I love going over old stuff for that. Like, just like, oh, yeah. God, the cringe. Okay, so before we get into like Fool's Gods, I, I want to talk about. So before like Night Vale becomes a thing. <laughs> Right, you you're working for the stage, right? Like that's what you. Yeah, I mean, like my part time job was doing theater in New York for a company called the Neo Futurists, but that that wasn't paying hardly any of the bills. Like that was paying <laughs> for my drinks after. And, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I worked at I worked at a not uh, an art house cinema. Um, basically, okay. we're, it's a non profit organization, so I worked in the fundraising office for them oh, in cool. uh, in New York City, uh, which is great fun. You got to see a lot of cool old movies and art house films and things like that for free. And yeah. And it, yeah, it was a great job. It was very like nine to five Monday through Friday. Yeah. 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 And then you can go out and have fun. Yeah. Time. allows you to do evening rehearsals and weekend productions of theater and things like that. Yeah. That's cool. So then you go to Night Vale with, with Joseph Fink, right? That's mm-hmm. what, Oh, there's something I have to ask you. Yeah. Are you a co-creator of Night Vale or just a co-writer of Night Vale? Because I see it written different. I, it's it's a weird thing to explain because we don't often have the co-creator co-writer thing. Right. We usually say co-creator. Um, okay. You know the we Joseph had the idea for let's do a podcast and I said sure and then he wrote the pilot episode without any like knowledge or plan of where it would go. Right. Okay. And then he recorded it with Cecil and with John who does the back, backing music. John had already had all that music composed years oh, before right. okay. and Joseph was just like, can I use this? Because I think it would fit a thing I'm doing. <laughs> and John said yes. And then Joseph just did the whole like 23 minute first episode. Wow. Emailed it to me and was like, I was thinking something like this for a podcast. What do you think? <laughs> and then we, I was like, sounds amazing. So we, we sat down and then from that point on, we started like developing the first several episodes and right, yeah. figuring out rules for how we engage the show and how we write it okay, and schedule yeah. it and blah, blah, blah. So uh, co-creator is, is, is completely fair. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, is, is there a point where you remember Night Vale becoming Night Vale? Because now it's got like hundreds of thousands of people yeah. in the world that are just loving it. Yeah. More, you know, it's hard to tell. But presumably initially you're just, you're just a bunch of guys 
uploading a thing and hoping yeah. that someone listens. Before. Yeah, it was um, it was very slow in the first year. Uh, like just like st- you know, I told you when you when you came over, I was talking about our very first episode. I think had a fifty downloads. Yeah, and um, and it just kind of like steadily increased over time. Okay. And um, we were getting after about like six months, we were getting around about a thousand downloads almost, and okay. uh, which was pretty exciting. And um, we started we had a Twitter account and a Facebook page and stuff, so we started like engaging with weird Twitter jokes and stuff right, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And um, and we started seeing people like doing a little bit of fan art because we had characters that weren't fully described. So they're like, well, this is what I think it looks like. And so that was that was kind of when you realize, oh, a lot of people that don't that I don't know are listening to this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which working in theater, like really, really small downtown theater in New York City, like most of the people coming to see what you do, are, you may not know them as somebody in the cast does. <laughs> yeah. so, so that was kind of cool. And it was, the, the real popularity of it happened, there was like a tipping point around about a one year anniversary okay. of our show. And it, it just blew up on Tumblr and it went from, a, a couple thousand people each month to to the you know hundred thousand you know wow. um, you know and so it was it, it really blew up in a way that you couldn't really control. No, yeah. yeah. Um, the the number I always use is in our first year we ended up breaking a hundred thousand downloads at our, around the, on our first one year anniversary um, over the over twelve months. Yeah. And then the thirteenth month alone it was two point five million downloads. Wow. And then the fourteenth month, with it was eight point six million downloads, and it was just everybody suddenly whatever made everybody say, "I have to hear the show." They went and downloaded all thirty whatever episodes at the yeah, time, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and it, and it that's it incredible. Blew, it was amazing, and uh, we both still had full time jobs, <laughs> and so it was weird being like sort of treated like you're a celebrity, even though you're not, and you work yeah. in a thing, and that's when you start getting like emails of people like criticizing you or talking about you <laughs> online in a way of like I'm here I'm like right here what are you doing I'm a real person <laughs> uh, I mean that's weird and then you just got no explanation for that it just one day there's a lot of explanations I mean the, the, the shortest version is just I just say Tumblr <laughs> um, <laughs> Tumblr happened I mean, Tumblr I think, decided that you were brilliant yeah, I think it was I think it was a few things I mean one, one we were kind of the first serial fiction podcast it yeah. was built as a podcast. Thrilling Adventure Hour had been doing this too, but they were a stage show putting their stage right. recordings okay. out yeah, as yeah, a podcast. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's something about, I think Weird Town USA is always a really popular genre within yeah. kind of like the, the Tumblr nerd community. Um, and so that helps. And, and I think what we heard a lot of with our early fans when it blew up was the canonically like gay couple at the, the center right. of it of, of, of yeah. Cecil and Carlos. Um, and I think that that just wasn't a just wasn't existing a lot. There were a lot of gay characters in mass media, but right. not to the normalized way that Cecil and Carlos were. Of like we're just main characters, and it's just there. Yeah. And this isn't like this character isn't about his gayness, or it's not he's yeah. not a funny background yeah. character yeah. or a tragic. He is gay, but it's not a plot thread. Like. Right. right. <laughs> and not to say that it shouldn't be. It's just to say that in yeah. that world, I think the casual way in which he is just gay. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of people really appreciated that. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting. Okay, talk talk about what other people appreciate. What don't you appreciate? <laughs> <laughs> what what <laughs> what um, is your fool's gold? This is the fool's gold. So I, I was actually I, I was going to say I was recently talking about this, but I've been talking about this for months now. <laughs> is um, and this is going to sound awful, kind of off brand for a Night Vale writer, but man, I just don't like Twin Peaks. <laughs> I just don't. Um, I watched the new series on Showtime, and um, I actually watched seventeen of the eighteen episodes. And I'm just so, I just it was almost maybe a form of protest not to watch the last, <laughs> not to watch the finale. I think there's a lot of it that's really great. I don't want to be like the oh, I'm smarter than you because I don't like this thing that yeah, you yeah, like, yeah. but. I think there's a lot to like. Visually, it's really stunning. The eighth episode, he goes full eras- eraser head um, okay. for like 45 minutes, and it's with almost no words and black and white and surreal, horrifying imagery, and it's wonderful and beautiful and scary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but David Lynch, I don't think, cares much for women. And it's <laughs> it's sort of disturb- disturbing that like most of the female characters in the show, and I don't even say this as a like feminism or whatever. I mean, it comes from that place, but it also comes from a like 
I just want an interesting story. And it's really bothersome when you have so many characters that you just don't care about other than as plot points and it becomes dull after a while. Yeah. So there's a lot of characters that are like, you have Naomi Watts' wife character to do. Have you seen the show at all? I'm going to try not to spoil it for people. I mean, I'm I'm happy to be spoiled. I mean, people listening may not be, I don't know, but... (laughs) I think I can get away with not spoiling. Okay. So, so many of my friends love Twin Peaks. Uh-huh. So you should get, but I've got like a little contrary streak in me. Basically, the more people tell me to watch something, the less yeah. likely that becomes. Oh, I'll tell you to watch it because I just need somebody to talk about it too. <laughs> it's the way of like, it's like, oh my God, this milk is spoiled here. Taste this, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, the, yeah, but the, you have, you have like Naomi Watts plays the wife of uh, one of the Dale Cooper uh, doppelgangers named Doogie. Uh, and she's so like she's played as so shrill and over the top, and it just feels like an archetype, a stereotype that doesn't really fit anything. It just feels like, oh, this is how housewife behaves. <laughs> and I think based on like David Lynch's uh, earlier works, like uh, Blue Velvet, I, I think he's always been interested in like critiquing suburban America, like right. 1950s yeah, yeah. suburban cookie cutter house, white people, nuclear family, America. And so I think he's, I think he's undermining that with her character, but it just comes off as in like, I don't know what women are like. <laughs> Let's try this. Um, most of the people who die are women who have very few lines in the show. Right. Um, there's a, there's a character who plays basically like evil Dale and the show hires essentially like two hitmen okay. to work with him. Uh, basically like two bad criminals and one's a man one's a woman and the man has this through line it's kind of up and down like uh, <laughs> betrayals and this and that and give and yeah. take of whatever he has a full arc and the woman after like two episodes has almost no lines of dialogue and then when she does finally have lines of dialogue she's in her underwear in a motel bed and then just gets strangled to death what? and her, it's just pl- her pleading for her life and it's a, the show is just kind of incessant about stuff like that and I um, and then you get to the, the idea that it's 18 episodes and many of the scenes are just like four minutes of Jennifer Jason Lee and, and, and Tim Roth talking about hamburgers in a van <laughs> and nothing happens. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I just, I found the whole thing absolutely in, infuriating, but you know, it has its moments and I, I grew up loving, I'll say this when, when I was in high school, was, I'll date myself when I was in high school. <laughs> Firewalk with me. The film came out, and I'd never okay. seen the TV show. Didn't know anything about it. Saw the movie, and I loved it because it was so weird, and it yeah. was actually truly scary to me uh, <laughs> because it was so strange. And I didn't watch the TV show until maybe two thousand nine. And at that point, I remember thinking, "There's some cool stuff in here, but this is really, really dull." There's. It just feels like a. It feels like a, a, a like a dull prime time network drama yeah. uh, with quirky characters and then every so often something bizarro happens like a giant appears out of nowhere or something and yeah, yeah that was really it and I, I just think over time I, I feel like we've inflated this thing because it's I think ultimately a pretty dull story told without editing with <laughs> the occasional moment of like pure visual brilliance yeah. by a person I think visually is is so gifted for, for what he can see on screen. But to me, after these 18, 18 hours of new Twin Peaks, I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, there's just, we're talking like 10%. Like, I really think we just need to do a hard edit that's like two hours of just the coolest <laughs> stuff over the course of every bit of Twin Peaks. <laughs> David, love your TV show. Should be a movie. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about that that I found, I, again, this is just me being irritated. I, I really, no shade to, to David Lynch, but the... I remember reading a thing that they showtime in those 18 episodes don't refer to them as episodes. They're called 18 parts because David Lynch referred to it as a film that that can be broken up into 18 parts. Right. So it is a film (laughs) that is almost 18 hours long. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was my that was my fool's gold, and I just man, it just feels good to say that out loud to somebody. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, because it is like you say, it is quite. It's not the answer I would expect from someone who writes Night Vale <laughs> you know, within the wires. Mm-hmm. Like it's a it's like a cultural phenomenon, Twin Peaks, isn't it? They just don't. It's passed me by. Yeah, it's just it's, walked... I think it's part of this current thing that we're doing, and it happens in every generation, which is where we go back twenty years 
and we dig up stuff from the past. So, cause yeah. we find, especially, um, people who get to be 40 years old, you, you start saying, Oh, well, okay. These people are, have disposable income and you do this <laughs> thing. Let's market to them. Let's, let's find the stuff that was really popular when they were 16 to 24 years old. Yeah. And so you reboot these sorts of things <laughs> constantly. And, uh, so we, we, we rebooted Gilmore Girls and we rebooted, uh, oh, you know, we're only going back 15 years to do stuff like that, but... Did you watch the reboot of Gilmore Girls? I, I did not. My wife did. Oh. Uh, she, but, um, she seemed so uninspired in describing it. I thought, I, I have too much else to get on yeah. with. Because I love Gilmore Girls. I did too. I think too. it was a brilliant TV show. Yeah. My wife started watching it on Netflix when she was ill and... I was just I just ignored it you know I was like that's not going to be a show I like uh-huh. so I went into the other room I did other things and then she got quite ill for a bit and so I sat in the room with her uh-huh. about, about season four this is uh, and uh, so I watched a full season with her and then I go and start secretly watching <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much such a good show so brilliant but they just don't recapture that no magic no but yeah, I think I think there is a generational thing where we start rebooting stuff that's 15, 20 years old because you there's always there's always more gold to be mined, right? The, the yeah, yeah. To, oh, that's fool's gold. There we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're always trying to redo that. And I think Twin Peaks had that too. Of of yeah. I think they know there's a whole class of uh, people like me, Uber nerds from the nineties that are eighties and nineties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get anything. <laughs> yeah, we've got proper jobs now. We'll, yeah, uh, we'll pay for it. <laughs> I mean, that, that just seems the way it's going Yeah. sort of commercially now is that we're just going to have to live with that. Yeah, it's just going to be a thing. And I, it makes me think of, like, I remember as a kid in the 80s, there was this real revival of, like, 50s music. And I remember okay. just there was a thing where it just felt like um, just people were playing, like, um, uh, 50s and 60s music. People, I just remember as a kid, like, just always hearing, like, Motown and Elvis and yeah, yeah. stuff like that. And that would make sense because these are... You know, my parents were in their 30s in the 1980s. And yeah. Yeah, so it's a thing where you're like, oh, yeah, I remember this as a kid. <laughs> this is great. At least you can't reboot music, eh? Like, you just play it again. You right? just play it again, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can sample it or whatever, but it's not, that's not it. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess we kind of, like, try to remake a, an essence of it. Like, when Drive came out, the movie Drive with Ryan Gosling. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but the whole soundtrack is very, like, 80s synth pop <laughs> sounding. Like, and even the logo is very, like, yeah, ne- yeah. neon hand cur- cursive writing, whatever. It's a good movie. Yeah, I like that movie. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. All right, so let's let's find out. What is Jeffrey Cranell's hidden gem? So, in thinking about Twin Peaks, I wanted to do the the I wanted to turn it into a positive, right? Like a, like okay. a true job interview, right? <laughs> like, here's my weakness, but here's what makes it great. So, in thinking about like weird films, and weird shows, uh, something I really do like, and I found really inspirational, I, and I started, I found this guy uh, right about the time I was watching the Twin Peaks series, like in 2009, is a uh, Swedish filmmaker named Roy Anderson. Okay. And um, he has uh, a few films. He has he has three sort of a a, a trilogy, if you will, of films, and they are called uh, Songs from the Second Floor, You the Living, and A Pigeon Sat on a Branch Reflecting on Its Existence. <laughs> it's the last <laughs> one, and these are all very like high minded, like philosophy one hundred and one style yeah. titles, but. Uh, Roy Anderson is hilarious and beautiful. Uh, his his works are very strange. They're they're vignette ish. They're, they're anthologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they don't tend to you don't tend to have one single character whose whose arc you follow. It tends to be like snapshots of different people, yeah. uh, sort of interspersed. And they're existential and when you low. Think so. Yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and sort of uh, low energy, but a lot of like visual and physical humor to them okay. and a lot of uh, really beautiful moments in them too and, and the the thing that I think about in, when I saw You the Living there's a scene where you have it kind of returns to this one bar over and over and it's it's all in Swedish and it's dubbed in English or um, uh, subtitled in English and there's this one young woman who just works in the bar and, and she is you know occasionally she's you know, uh, you know, talking to people, but at one point in time, she's trying to. She she sees this guy come into the bar that she recognizes as the lead singer of this famous band. Okay, I think it's made up for the movie, but <laughs> she's just really taken by him, and and uh, and then later she just has a moment where she's staring straight at the camera, and it's a really wide shot. So it's the whole bar and everything happening behind <laughs> her, and she's just talking straight to the camera, and she says, "I." I 
I have this dream. I have this dream about Mickey, who's the name of the guitarist lead singer guy. He's like, you know, kind of like choppy black hair hanging in his face and that kind of look. And she's like, I have this dream. And then, and it kind of just segues into um, her in a wedding gown and uh, Mickey in like a tuxedo holding his guitar. And they're in this tiny little apartment um, next to a window. And yeah. he's just playing the guitar. And it's just this long sequence of like him playing this like, really great old time like rock solo like uh talking about 80s 90s right like back <laughs> yeah. when the big uh guitar solo was in and he's playing this guitar solo with her and they're just it's a really peaceful scene where they're sort of in love and and beautiful and the window next to them next to them at their little kitchen table is you see the light coming in but it, it's sort of flickering Okay. And, and you, you kind of become drawn to the window, and as you realize what's happening, is this that it's it's the back, it's it's moving. Everything and behind them in the through the window is just zooming past them, like everything. And you're like, oh, what a cool visual. And then um, everything starts slowing down, and you realize that there it's like a city, and it starts going through tunnels, and then you start seeing roads, and then it just gets slower and slower, and then you start seeing people, and then basically it pulls up, and you're at a train station. <laughs> And, uh, and there's just a herd of people and they open the window and they all start shouting for them. And they're like, uh-huh. you know, Mickey and I forget her name, Anna or something, but like Mickey and Anna, Mickey and Anna. And they're chanting and in the background. Somebody's playing, has a giant tuba and they're just playing an Oomba <laughs> song like while everyone's cheering. And they kind of reach out and they welcome everyone and thank them for their, <laughs> thank them for their, their good wishes. And then the final scene is from the train station side. And you just see the couple like waving out of a window of a ground floor apartment of a, of a tall apartment building that just goes up and off the screen. And then the very finale is you just see the apartment building just drifting off <laughs> back into the horizon. And it, I, I, I was always really taken with that image. I just always thought it was beautiful and nice. And I thought it was, a, it just really, I, mean, I thought about like young, irrational, not irrational, but like uh, that young love, that thing of like, I really love this person. And I, yeah. I don't know how to wrap my head around how to actually know them and uh it just it it just seemed like the ludicrous but really beautiful and really meaning uh like heartfelt dream that somebody like that would have um so he uses a lot of really cool things like that he has another scene in songs from the second floor where this guy who's had this horrible day and he's all just completely disheveled has ash and soot on his face and he gets on the uh the tube and he's uh he's standing there and everybody is looking sort of miserable and holding onto the straps and leaning and packed tight and then um you, you sort of hear symphonic music and then you just see the one behind him just start opening her mouth and then you hear like this kind of like choral song and then everyone on the train is just singing this beautiful choral song behind him while he's just kind of like holding on his eyes drooping he's shaking back and forth as the train moves and that's just the whole scene it's a really beautiful really surrealist type of, of, of yeah. moments like that so um yeah i just uh, roy anderson uh Pigeon sat on a branch reflecting on its existence is the most recent installment, and, and, I, and I loved it. I just absolutely adored the film. I mean, that sounds, that sounds awesome. Because like, it's... I really like that you picked, like, movies, right? Or, mm-hmm. or a director. It's hard, I think, to find good independent movies mm-hmm. now, right? Like, a lot of them get bought up by streaming services, right? So they're there, mm-hmm. but they're never pushed. So... You don't actually discover them, right? They're, mm-hmm. in, they're in the library. <laughs> mm-hmm. but... <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is very true. Finding out how to pick something is the hardest thing. Oh, Netflix is super overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. 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 Netflix is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's, a, there's a bunch of like secret codes for Netflix, mm-hmm. where, which you can look up and to help you search for oh, really specific genre types. That actually makes it even more daunting because you look at this list of the more specific genre yeah. types and it just keeps scrolling down the screen. Oh, <laughs> God, I have to learn programming. <laughs> That's really scary. But the, those movies sound, sound beautiful. Like, yeah. I'm not... Like, cause I'm a bit of a film buff. Yeah. I, I don't think... Like, I know the name Roy Anderson, but I've never watched anything that he's, he's put out. Yeah, he's, he's really amazing. I went... I did, like, a, a, did a YouTube crawl one night looking up. He's... A commercial director so he's like oh, okay. uh, 
Uh, like Errol Morris is another great example of a guy who makes all these amazing documentaries, but most of his money comes from doing TV commercials yeah, and yeah, yeah. making like Miller High Life commercials and whatever. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Roy Anderson did a, a bunch of Swedish TV ads, and they're all like bizarre and dark. You right, know, yeah, it's yeah, a, they're they're always uh, dark and strange and. Well, that's fun, uh, yeah. at least. <laughs> yeah. And he has a cool visual. I, I, I've never studied in film, but having done theater, Roy Anderson exclusively does all of his work on, on sound stages, um, which okay. is not yeah. unusual. But uh, rather than kind of, uh, there's often like, sound stages often have a very sitcom type of look, a yeah, network yeah, program, yeah. like Friends, a very like sound stage <laughs> looking. Like, this is clearly in Los Angeles. This is in Burbank, even, probably. <laughs> there's a, uh, but Roy, Roy does this thing where he, Builds uh, movies take forever to make because they they take uh, they hand build all the sets and paint and do all these sorts of things and he uses a very like monochromatic type of look. So what he does is he films on these really enormous sets, paints it in all flat colors, and so what ends up happening is you get these weird depth perception things yeah, that happen, yeah. and uh, uh, and so. Um, it, it, it creates a, like an uncanny valley of reality uh, that happens. And it, yeah, I just, I'm always fascinated with that. I don't know that much. I've never done real tech theater type of things, but no, yeah, yeah. reading about some of his processes. Uh, and I saw he was in New York a few years ago and I, I saw him talk about the, the making of his, of yeah. his movies and, yeah, it just takes him forever to film these things because he has a very particular look. I'm like, I really appreciate that. I really love that. I love yeah, that yeah. you can, going back to our ad, ad conversation, like <laughs> ads pay for artists. And in his case, like he makes ads in order to make the money so he can go off and do these types of films. Although in Sweden, I would imagine they probably cover him pretty well in a way that America would not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's wrap up with some... I mean, I call them quick fire questions. I'm going to have to come up with a new name for them because nobody ever. I think Steph and Jordan answered them fairly quickly, and then uh-huh. since then, just people like to talk about the things they love or hate. So try and be pithy, but we'll try. We'll try, I'll try and do quick fire. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. I've got to remember the questions now. <laughs> okay. So this is just your favorite and your least favorite kinds of thing. Okay. What is your favorite movie? Uh, I'm going to say You the Living. I say it all the time. That's Roy Anderson, yeah, going back to yeah. that. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, your least favorite? My least favorite movie is Easy. It's Babel. Babel? It's the, by uh, Inyari 2 uh, with uh, Brad Pitt and... Uh, oh, yeah. Um, um, Victoria. Uh, the, she's um, amazing. <laughs> and I'm blanking on her name. Uh, Kate Blanchett. Yeah, okay. Right, good. Uh, TV show? Uh, favorite? Yeah. Uh, favorite TV show... Uh, you know, I'm going to go with... Oh, man, I'm, I started... My brain started frying. You know what I'm going to go with? Because I'm, I'm obsessed with it right now. I don't know if this will last, but right now it's Good Place. Oh, I love the Good Place. Yeah, yeah, Fantastic. right. I just love it. I Brilliant. just love it. Maybe two years from now, people will be like, this is garbage, <laughs> but uh, it's great. Yeah, Kristen Bell, Ted Danson. Yeah, so good. Brilliant. Your least favorite TV show? My Oh, man. Well, it's hard because I generally bail out so fast. Yeah. Um, I think... I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to say probably. Gonna have to say. Oh, you know what it is? It's early '80s. It was when I was a kid. Three's Company. Okay. Like, it always made me so nervous watching that show because right. I would think it's a it's a true situation comedy. And all I thought about as a kid was like, if you just told the truth, like you just <laughs> just tell everyone what you're feeling, and everyone would be like, oh, well, this is fine. Yes, you can live here. Yes, this is a thing. You don't have to fake everything all the time. It made me so upset. I was a really, really like traumatized child over Three's Company. Just developing your childhood anxiety. <laughs> yes. Yeah. To this day, I hate conflict. I just just want everyone to be happy. Amazing. Okay, so. Your favorite superhero? Uh, that kind of varies. Uh, I'm going to go... I always come back to Professor Xavier. Oh, okay. amazing. Yeah, because yeah. I was an X-Men kid growing up. Yeah, and yeah. I just thought, yeah, I, I really like I really like Professor X. He was great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, your least favorite superhero? Uh, I hate Superman. I just, I just <laughs> never never liked it. I, as a kid, like I found the movies sort of fun and whatever yeah. else. But yeah, I, don't, I, I didn't love how much... Uh, I don't love how much like how big his power is and then there's just one true weakness and I just yeah. never wrapped my head around the concept of, of Superman but it's, it's a really hard and some writers some brilliant writers have, have made him interesting but I think he's a hard mm-hmm. character to make interesting because not only does he have all this power yeah. like he's he's basically invulnerable yeah right unless you've got a MacGuffin yeah but he's also like the 
you know, the American hero, right? He's also like a goody two shoes. There's not even any like character conflict, really. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. What do you do with this guy? <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely it. And also because he's the most famous of all superheroes. So, in yeah. a way, it's kind of like hating you two. Um, it's very simple <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to do. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's go with a book. A uh, favorite book is The Last Samurai by Helen DeWitt. Uh, okay. came out in 2003. It is has nothing to do with the Tom Cruise movie. Um, <laughs> it is a, a really beautiful story about a uh, a single mother raising a son uh, who is uh, like a he, she's like a five year old like super prodigious son like he's incredibly intelligent and so she's trying to keep him occupied while she does her like data entry job at home <laughs> and he is um, trying to learn Greek and he's reading all the uh, the ancient philosophers and he's reading oh, uh, he's reading uh, he's watching uh, the title comes from the fact that he watches uh, Kurosawa's uh, Seven Samurai over yeah. and over and over again so the book just constantly reanalyzes the film <laughs> through him um, and uh yeah, it, it, I just think it's a really stunning and amazing book. And you feel like as she's teaching him Greek, like you'll read 20 pages of this and you'll be like, I know Greek now. <laughs> it's really great. It's a great book. Fantastic. Least favorite book? Uh, this is very simple. Uh, this is, there is a book, uh, I think his name is Edward Rutherford. He writes uh, okay. fictional, his, historical fiction. Right. Um, kind of epic, like James Missioner style. And so he had one called New York. I think he has another one called Paris. So it kind of like picks an area and then over two centuries or whatever tells generational stories and I actually sort of enjoyed the book it's kind of neat it's page turny it's uh, yeah. all, you know you kind of track through 300 years of New York history and through these individual people but um, it's it's maudlin at times and there's a there's a moment um, boy this made me so mad because it's like an 800 page novel and I read the right. whole thing and I get to the end and there's this kind of the current day guy in the in like mid aughts yeah. is talking about he gets obsessed with uh, strawberry fields in Central Park where uh, there's a John Lennon memorial and um, <laughs> and he starts talking about that um, uh, he starts talking about Imagine the song Imagine by John Lennon super creative and then the last like the epilogue the last like page and a half is about him looking at where they're building the new World Trade Center tower the Freedom Tower yeah. and I want to say I, I don't have it committed to memory because I, I don't want to get cancer but uh, <laughs> this this last sentence was the most infuriating sentence in the English language and he something to the effect of like and I thought about strawberry fields and I thought about imagine and I thought about the the World Trade Center and the Freedom Tower and I imagine those um, and I thought about the long lastingness of human life or whatever and I thought about those words and I thought imagine freedom forever uh, and I literally threw the book across uh, my room. <laughs> and I was so angry that that's how an 800-page novel ran <laughs> I've never been more angry in my entire life. <laughs> All right, so that's just sickening. <laughs> okay, uh, well, because it's you, your favorite podcast. Oh, my favorite podcast. Currently, my favorite podcast is The Adventure Zone. I'm not caught up through all of their episodes. Do you know The Adventure Zone? I don't, know. So the McElroy brothers who do My Brother, My Brother, and Me uh, on the Max Fun Network, they're very funny guys, uh, super hilarious. Uh, they've been doing podcasting forever. They do 50% of all podcasts are made by the McElroy brothers, I feel like. And they're, they're, really, they're really tremendous. And uh, But they started this uh, show with their, their father a couple years ago. Um, and what it is is they had never really played D&D &D before, but okay. then they just started playing D&D &D. and the youngest brother Griffin is the dungeon master and uh, the other three built out characters and then they just go on these adventures and early on it's they kind of play with a stock game from the D&D &D yeah. comes with and they're like okay well we'll play this goblin game or whatever and but as it goes Griffin starts writing the stories and then he starts writing these really elaborate stories that all sort of start connecting back to things from the beginning oh, wow. so he starts building a a serial fiction podcast <laughs> through playing D&D &D. and it goes from these guys are all funny and the show remains funny because they're funny people yeah. but it, it really becomes grounded in these really meaningful characters so you start really caring about like I really care about what happens to this person <laughs> I really care about that this person that's on their adventure that's just yeah. a made-up person in the universe and um, really creative stuff with like time loops and cool stuff that Griffin plays with and he really just becomes a really amazing storyteller and it's funny as hell and <laughs> I didn't really play D&D &D much as a kid because of the satanic panic of the 1980s I wasn't allowed near it but uh I don't think that happened to him oh that's probably uh, that, <laughs> it's, in retrospect that's a shame because it's hilarious because <laughs> right. we thought every child was going to become a satanist right um, okay 
So, anyways, uh, the Adventure Zone is fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. This may be hard. Your least favorite podcast. Oh man, boy, I have a lot that I don't like. Um, You're allowed to decline. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think I'd have to go off the record with the ones that I truly <laughs> truly dislike that are that are popular. I, you know, there there are a few that I that I popped on that that sort of that I, that I find more aggravating than others. I, I think, and I'll talk about a general type, which okay. is like there's there's a real like as the comedy podcast became very popular, especially like the Mark Maron style interview yeah, yeah. thing. I think the offshoot of that uh, became this real like heavy like white male bro thing that started happening okay. and I, I find that it became really grating to me and, and that and so early on in podcasting it's a lot better now because there's so many more shows showing yeah, up yeah, yeah. and there's a lot more like I think conscientious white dudes making podcasts <laughs> now too which is great because um, I don't have to worry if I see like if I but if I if I see like the logo for a podcast if it's like two white guys I'm like instantly like well I know I don't have to listen to that that's great <laughs> um, not that listen nothing against white guys I mean, it's just a matter of yeah, like yeah. once that becomes your identity I'm like oh no there's so much of that like you have to differentiate <laughs> yourself and yeah, I think I think anything that was sort of like a broy type of stuff. Yeah. But I, for the most part, I feel like everything I've listened to though is is fairly good. You know, there's there's there's, there's, a, lot of stuff. there's a couple of like fiction podcasts that I listen to. Like this is just not for me. Uh, yeah. A couple of, like chat shows I've listened to where I'm like, oh, this seems fine, <laughs> um, whatever. And I think you know stuff like with the things that we do too. Like I've definitely talked to people who've been yeah. like, you know, like I listened to the first couple episodes of Within the Wires. It didn't seem like my thing. I'm like totally understandable. <laughs> yeah. And the beauty is, unlike theater, I don't have to be here for you to enjoy my work. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it doesn't cost me quite as much as theater does to make. So um, it's really great. So yeah, I'll. Uh, uh, that was my really evasive way of getting out of that question. But, I mean that's absolutely yeah. fair. I, I, had a, I had a comedy critic on this podcast whose interview will be out before this one, and uh, she did answer the question mm-hmm. of her least favorite comedian, and I feel really awkward about it. Mm. I gave her the same opportunity to decline, but she no, she, she took went it. right into it. <laughs> Man, she didn't like go. It's you. <laughs> like oh shit. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> Thankfully uh, no. my past comedy career, I did not cross paths with Kate Copstick. <laughs> okay, so, well, one final question. If someone was going to make the story of your life, what medium would you want it to be in? And what would you call it? Oh, that's really good. Um, I should have prepped myself because I, I know you've asked that question before. <laughs> um, you know, I think I, I think I would want it in a book. Okay. Um, I, I think I think in, I, I, I've always liked non-visual storytelling like I've always liked yeah. um, that um, I think I think I'd want it in a book and I think it would be called I Don't Like Conflict <laughs> <laughs> it would be the dullest but very pl- most pleasant book you've ever read <laughs> This is a person I met. They're fine. <laughs> They're fine. It's good. They seemed upset at me, so I, I, I talked to them about it. I just said, is everything okay? And they said yes. And, uh, and then we continued with our lunch. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey Craner. For, thank you. For joining me. I'm glad we could do it. Wow. So that was Jeffrey. Like I said, such a nice guy and thoughtful as well. And as a creator, I have such respect for him. I'm not lying when I say that I love Within the Wires. I really like Night Vale, but Within the Wires really speaks to me. It's the first podcast I've found that I'm treating like appointment listening. I'm always waiting for the next episode to come out. There's one thing I should say. Jeffrey and Joseph Fink have written a novel called It Devours which comes out next week, I think. It's an independent story set in the Night Vale universe, so you don't need to be up to speed with the podcast to enjoy it. Obviously, I've not read it yet, but given these guys' track record, I reckon it'll be pretty good. I'll tell you how to vote for the theme music in a moment, but first, you heard a lot in this episode about my opinions on advertising and how difficult it is for creators to make money. So you can support this podcast by heading over to thatthispod.com. There's also a link in the show description. There are rewards for you if you donate. You can get me to analyse a piece of pop culture for YouTube. You can be interviewed for this podcast. You can even make me do a stand-up set about any topic you choose. 
As I mentioned at the top, you can help me choose the theme tune for this show. The first five episodes all have different theme musics, which I will then repeat over episodes 6 to 10 and 11 to 15. I didn't realise that episodes 10 and 11 would be going out at the same time, so to make it fair, they'll all get one more playthrough. There are three ways you can vote, either by making a comment on your donation to the podcast, by reviewing the show on iTunes, or you can share the podcast on social media, tagging me in at that this pod, so that I know which episode that you want. I've come up with a little code. In the comment on your donation, review or share of the show, include the word Ocelot for the music in episodes 1, 6 and 11, Tiger for the music in episodes 2, 7 and 12, Thrush episodes 3, 8 and 13, Fox 4, 9 and 14 and Falcon for the music in episodes 5, 10 and 15. Be creative with it, have some fun, I'll tally them up and whatever you decide will be the official Not That This theme music. Of course, if you've got anything else to say, you're welcome to email me as well. I'd love to include some letters in this podcast every now and again. So if you've got some praise, advice, questions, or even abuse to hurl at me, do do that. The email address is on the website, or if you know how to spell my name, it's geraint at thatthispod.com. Two more episodes next week. The first is with Dean Burnett. He's a comedy science writer for The Guardian, a neuroscientist, comedian, and the author of the very successful book, The Idiot Brain. Episode 11 will be a joint interview with the brilliant folk musicians Hannah James and Grace Petrie. It's a first for me because Grace Petrie was actually a hidden gem in episode 4. I'm very excited about it all. But until then, take care. I'll catch you soon.